This is Comet Picks by The Glick. Hey, and I'm your host, Jason Glick. Good evening, Jason Glick. How are you doing? I'm good, John. Yourself? Oh, I'm just getting ready for Turkey Day. <laughs> yeah, I'm just getting ready for the sales as well. For Hey, for those of us um, that are in the United States, that's a great analogy. If you're not in the United States, you know, we have this thing called Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I like, we actually do have people who um, visit the site from outside the States, and they're probably just saying, oh, fuck you people for having a holiday right now. Exactly. <laughs> well, we can, you know, Christmas is a little bit more worldwide, so, you know, hey. <laughs> but Thanksgiving is like our we have that we have that whole block which actually you know I, I would like to say starts at Halloween which most people around the world do have a you know a knowledge of yeah and actually I'm pretty sure that all all of our international people are going who have heard Thanksgiving saying oh yeah that's where you Yanks celebrate the uh, subjugation of the Native American peoples right exactly <laughs> no 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 maybe not so crude but yes absolutely i've heard it that described that way um anyway so what do you have for us tonight sir okay well it's like i'm going back to that inexhaustible well of comics that is the star wars franchise now long time readers and listeners know that you know i it's like i love i've been a, a reader of, the, of, of dark horse's star wars comics for a for a very long time now, even though there was a time when I you know stopped reading for for a while, I eventually got back got back in, into the habit and now own even more comics than I did back when I before I stopped. Now, and and as everyone who's probably listened to the podcast and read the site no, sites know, um, last year um, it was announced that you know with the acquisition of of um, Lucasfilm by by Disney, um, Mar- the the rights to produce Star Wars comics were now are reverting to Marvel. So, so Marvel's putting out um, their their new, their new Star Wars comics next year, starting with a uh, Star, Star Wars title um, featuring like Adventures of Han, Luke, Leia, et al. Um, from Jason Aaron and John Cassidy. Cassidy's around for the first arc. That's what I think. And um, a, a Darth Vader title from Kieran Gillen and um, Salvador La Roca, and a Princess Leia miniseries from Mark Wade and Terry Dodson. The uh, creative teams involved in these alone uh, basically maybe want to go and pick pick these up regardless, and I'm sure they're going to be great reads, but um, at the same time, though, I have a very strong affection for the stuff that Dark Horse has done over the years. Um, just, you know, from their first, from their first title, um, Dark, Dark Empire, which is the one that basically got me in the comics in the first place, all the way through um, John Ost- Ostrander's work from detailing the adventures of, um, of Quinlan Voss to the, uh, to the adventures of uh, of um, Luke Skywalker's grand- grandson, um, Cade Skywalker, in the pages of Star Wars Legacy, and of um, and of Jahan Cross in the two um, Agent of the Empire miniseries we got, which I would have loved to have seen a third, but you know the cards just weren't in, just wasn't in the cards for that. But um, anyway, but Dark Horse, you know, like because their um, license is up, they went they basically went and crashed um, the last um, couple of trades. Um, for for their like um like for their dark for their for their comic series in print last month, um, these include the final vo- final volume of Star Wars Legacy Volume Two, um, Matt Kint's um, Star Wars Rebel Heist miniseries, and the final two volumes of Brian Wood's ongoing Star Wars series. Now, Dark Horse has um really has uh, done a good job of uh, elevating the practice of, of um, how how good licensed comics can be over the like over the years. While they were first um, considered just you know like worthless tie-ins that that should just be handled by um, whoever in the office just wasn't busy that day, um, Dark Horse has proven that they can be um, you know sustainable works you know if you treat them with enough with enough care and respect. It's like that um, you know that um, fans would expect from their like from their properties indeed. So. So I mean, I've so I've really enjoyed a lot of the stuff that Dark Horse has done, but that that's not true of everything they've done. Case in point being um, the second volume of Star Wars Legacy, which um, basically picks up after the um, see after the defeat of Darth Darth Krayt at the end of um, John Ostrander and Jen Dursima's um, run on Legacy, and um, it's like you know now we've got the the uh, Galact- you know, Galactic Triumvirate basically you're, um, held between the uh, Let's see the let's see the the the, Imper- the imperial remnant the Galact- the remnants of the galactic republic and the it's like in the Jedi themselves, 
And um, into this mix, you throw um, one um, Ania Solo, who is like the descendant of that um, particular Solo clan. Now, here's here's the thing. Now, I can understand like the appeal of like, okay, we in the first series we followed the, the descendants, followed Luke's descendant, and now like why don't just follow up, you know, one of Han's descendants later on? And um, uh, over the, and um, it's been ha- it's been um, courted by Corinna Bechko and Gabriel Hardman, with Hardman providing the art for a couple arcs, and I've just been it started out you know just okay. I mean, I, I figured okay, well we'll see where this goes, but I've just not been re- really not been impressed by by how they've developed things over the course course of their run. I mean, like Annie, it just kind of feels like a like a fairly generic. Um, it's like. Like a, like a very generic pr- protagonist. I mean, just she's just buffeted along by the, it's like by the demands of the plot. Yeah, she ho- sh- toss off a, a witty one liner every like every once in a while. But overall, it's like I mean, she's like she, know, she's just she just lacks she 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 really lacks the charisma. It's like and um, it's like and a willingness to break genre convention that like that her grandfather had, and also um, oh yeah, and also it's worth noting now that the series like ends. Um, without ever really just you know giving us a good hey, I mean yeah we have like one more, one of our characters remembers points out hey you're related to that solo, but you know it's like we it ends without without ever explicitly um telling us you know just how you know like like her um her, her lineage ties up and just how why she is a, a smuggler on the um working on the backwaters of the planet but that's all. But you know that's that's the biggest pro- that's the biggest problem in the series. The second biggest problem is the fact that she's fighting that her opponent is basically a Sith named Darth Red, which good God, I think that's a stupid name. I mean, I mean, yeah, like you've got like good, I mean, like yeah, you got intimidating Sith names like you know Darth Sidious, Darth Krayt, and of course you know Darth Vader, the granddaddy of them all. But you know, it's like. This one's like Darth Red. I'm um, spelled W R E D D. It's like, oh man, they were just scraping the bottom of the barrel here. But um, you know, I will say this: the um, the final volume of Legacy, um, at least uh, makes, at least does a good job of convincing me that you know maybe there may have been a more interesting story to be told from from like exploring Darth Red's point of view. Than I'm um, focusing on 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 Anya Solos because as we learn here, turns out that um Red was a um, force sensitive living on an outer rim planet who um you know used his skills you know to help fight off the people who threatened his planet until he was until the Sith came and then um he was recruited because of his force sensitiveness and um then his planet was um put to the torch um short, shortly thereafter now he lived as um he he was um tor- tortured and trained by his by his sith master in equal measure but and then as soon as he um got the chance to uh to um like put it to, um, kill his master as we saw in the first volume he he basically put in a plan to basically basically go and um take and um exact revenge on the rest on the rest of the sith um Rest of the Sith Order, as we find here, as he um, as he has, as he has basically lured the uh, like the remnants of the Sith to a rogue planet, and um, along with um, the uh, Jedi he forced, he hopes to convince take as his apprentice um, Jawa Sam, and um, you know, basically like basically end the Sith Order one, once and for all. Now you know a Sith who hates the Sith so much that he wants to um, murder them all. You know that's that's kind of an interesting story where. Right? That's that's an interesting jumping off point right there, and I will say that you know ridiculous name aside, I kind of I would have liked to have seen that um, point of view um, develop more uh, more fully here, but in the end, you know it's like the uh, the uh, final volume of Legacy only collects three issues, um, plus the uh, plus a handbook telling you the state of the uh, the uh, Legacy timeline as it as it currently stands, and but it's, oh there's a whole lot of we gotta wrap this up now ness from this last volume and it's like okay you know it's like it and yes there is an ending here things are wrapped up for the most part it it is of course um extremely rushed but at least but it at least su- suggests the potential that there may have been something better here um all along take that as as you will um the main reason i can say to pick this up um, would be simply for the fact that the uh, legacy um, comics are probably going to be some of the first to kick 
are most assuredly going to be kicked out of continuity um, once Episode 7 comes out next year. And um, so whether or not um, these actually get reprinted at some point, well, your guess is as good as mine. Marvel has already indicated they are going to re- reprint um, some of the Dark Horse. Have already, has already, they've already indicated they're going to re- reprint some of the Dark Horse stuff. But at this point, it's only their reprint efforts are only confined to the uh, to, to the um, stuff between stuff um, sit within the uh, the film, like the film canon, the stuff that takes place between the film years and all. So. So yeah, it's like you, it's like you can go out and buy, um, buy volume two of Legacy, and because uh, it might not be um, available in, it's like um, might be going out of print real, real soon, but um, it's really not worth it. If you want a good Legacy tale, just go, just stick with the uh, eleven volumes from from Ostrander and Dursina's for original run. Now, also getting to the um, other stuff, you know, they Dark Horse did put out a lot of stuff, a lot of like um individual miniseries over the years. And um this see and uh this and um Rebel Heist was um see was one of them. And it it's notable for the fact that it actually um features um work from a uh I wouldn't quite say A list, but definitely a a uh, creator who is who's no stranger to um regular high profile work um from Marvel and D- and DC. That and that would be a uh, Matt Kent who um you know listeners and readers know here from from his work on um on my on, on Dark Horse's mind management, which I like, even though it's like it has, it's one of those styles that demands you basically reread each volume before you go and check out the next one. Next one actually, you know, come, will be arriving about a week. Will actually have arrived by the time this um, podcast comes out um, at, at my home. Anyway, but um, Rebel Heist, it's basically comes as advertised. It's basically um, it's a story about um, Han, Han, Leia. Um, Chewbacca and Luke, and and the uh, say and the the, uh, the people that they're working with in order to stage a um very um lar- very intricate um large like um large scale heist from the from the Empire. Now, the ser- it's like now the series um does actually um um ha- um utilize a lot of um Kint's um talent for just like really in- interconnected. It's like it's like really. Like let's see, inter- interconnected and let's see, it's like in detailed plotting in the sense that you know once you like there's a lot of little stuff here that's laid out over the course of the first three issues that once you get to the final the fourth issue, you know becomes really everything becomes starts snapping into focus and then when you go back and reread it again you realize okay this is what's actually going on and it's just, and it's kind of cool to pick up on on these things. Granted, it's not um, as intricate. Or ornate as um, his work on mind, mind management, but you know it's interesting to, to um, note that the um, you know it's like you got um, that the uh, the story is actually primarily told through through um, four um, supporting characters. These are characters you got a um, new recruit who is paired up with Han Solo, and he's just you know he wants to do the right thing, but he's also um, you know freaked out by the fact that this by by this. Um, Rebel operative they paired him with is just like so self destructive and the most dangerous man he's ever met in his life. Then you've and you also got a um, Twi'lek who's working at undercover, who's working undercover and basically um, has to team up with this princess in order to um, you know convey the information she's got. And then there's a uh, you know stormtrooper who's basically a living code that you know doesn't think much of having to work with a Wookiee at first, but actually learns to um, learns that this that this creature actually. You know, it does have the, his best in, best interests in mind, and and finally, you've got a um, Bothan spy who um, who's basically um, um shadowing um Luke's movements and the movements of the entire rebel operation, and just, who's basically like won over by their it's like it's by their by their the sheer audacity of their plans. It's like it's it's not um a, I wouldn't say it's a, a Great story, but it's but it's well executed for what it is, and the uh, when you find out what the, and the uh, thing that they're stealing um, will be instantly recognizable to anyone who has seen um, the Empire Strikes Back. So it's like a fun bit of um, movie um, movie continuity as well. Um, I do kind of wish that the uh, art had been um, I, don't know, I guess just a bit a bit more solid. It's from a guy named um, Marco Castiello, and he's I don't know so he's got. A, Decent handle on the detail. His character work is kind of feels kind of bit, bit sketchy and rushed, and like in parts. But it's 
no, it's not. It's not bad. It gets a st- gets a story across for what it is, but it's not, you know, as dynamic or as exciting as you ex- expect from. It's like from from other, compared to what I've seen from other from other Star Wars Star Wars art. So, you know, Rebel Heist, you know, it's fun. I can probably see. I'm sure I can see Dark Horse picking. I mean, Marvel reprinting this at some point. But um, oh well, it's not. It's like it's not bad if you get it. Get it. Like I said, get it now before it um run, before it goes right out of. Right out of print. Anyway, the uh, last two volumes for Dark Horse, I'll be picking for Dark Horse um, for, for the immediate future anyway, are the final two volumes of Brian Wood's um, like ongoing Star Wars um, Star Wars series. And that, I generally, like, and I, and I generally enjoyed what he, was, what he was doing there. He did a good, good job of um, digging, in, digging into the characters and the setting. And, and also, I'm telling you, Showing us like a nice take on Darth Vader, who was, you know, at some times he um, weakened after his um, after the events of the uh, episode four and the destruction of the Death Star, but still a thoroughly intimidating presence. It's like as it's like as a result. Now, these final two volumes, it's kind of interesting how they um, how dark or, how, how they were positioned because volume three um, reprints ep- um, issues um, fifteen through fifteen through eighteen. And um, volume four um, presents um, issues thirteen through fourteen, and um, nineteen and twenty. Um, then you, it's like so it's but um, so like there's so like there's a bit of disconnect right there, and it's kind of apparent with um with, um volume three called Rebel Girl, which you see um finds um Princess Leia um you know agreeing to marry the Prince of Arakar in order to provide a base for the for the uh, Rebel Alliance. Now what's that you say? Um, Princess Leia agreeing to be married? It's like that's preposterous. And yeah, that's probably the storyline's biggest failing in the sense that the storyline just that this arc kind of starts like really starts in media res in the sense that, you know, we're we're told that, you know, that Leia um like met the prince here, like after she had stopped on planet to uh to um, um refill her fresh water supply. But um it's but it starts off kind of like, you know, a hey, this is like this is like kind of really sudden and all. It's like it sounds sounds kind of ridiculous as well. And um, I will say that you know the uh, fact that the that um, while the prince is definitely he definitely likes Leia and he def- wants to do the good thing by her, it's like by the rebellion. Um, his uh, let's see his inner circle led by his um, advisor general is not. They are they they are clearly not to be trusted. Just from the um, instant you see their you see their faces and you think yeah these guys. Definitely up to no good. So, um, so it's basically a fairly standard, standard story of um, let's see, let's see, um, talk, I'm showing us how the um, how the rebellion like, you know starts, you know starts um, setting up on on planet, um, like um, print Leia, it's like Leia goes through goes through the motions of getting of of getting ready for married life. Um, Luke, it's like Luke acts kind of creepy because he's bummed out about Leia getting married, and Han just you know kind of. Kind of acts, bit, acts bitchy at the same time, so. But um, but um, Wood actually does does miss a good job in the, like the little little details for the story, such as um, you know, the, the bits with um, like with Luke finally getting a chance to um talk talk to Ben. It's like at, after after a certain point, and um, just and the uh, the troubles he troubles he goes through when when he's going up when he goes on a on a hike to um to, to replace a. Uh, like a broken power cell with some some of the arrangers of the like a, of the planet, and uh, one thing I really liked was which is when um like on Leia um like whoops out a, when the, um when Sis Chu and shit starts going bad and Leia whips out a blaster to give to Mon Mothma in order to defend herself and, she, and Mothma was like why did you bring a blaster to your to your wedding it's like well like, yeah I did because why not and I say yeah that's kind of that's the Leia that I like and um it's like and it's I mean it's still it's still, it's a fun story like that's wholly predictable. To the like to the very end, but still, it's like you know, like the little the little touches and little details would would invest in in the uh, material in the story, you know, like make it like um el- do elevate it somewhat. Um, however, on um, the final volume, um, a shattered hope, um, is act- is definitely a, is um outright good, um, without any re- reservations as far as I'm concerned, because it tells two two different two part stories. The first is um five days of the, of Sith. Which basically has a um, an unassuming a uh, like a, how do you say it tells just tells of a of a lieutenant in the Empire's um, work 
um, attachment to a um, special detail assigned, like that Darth Vader's recruited himself. Because after the events of Volume 2, and um, it was revealed that a general in the Empire was actually a Repu- was actually a spy for the Rebel Alliance, um, Vader's wonder- Vader is busy, um, is looking to crack some heads, literally, actually, to find out just, you know, how this happened and you know, just what, what was this guy's or what was this guy's deal in the first place? Well, I do think that the, um, that, um, the, uh, business of having, um, you know, like, um, like, you know, secondary characters in order to explore on hand, like, you know, sh- you know, convey like, you know, like, okay, this is what we feel as we're working with these, like, you know, really iconic characters. Um, that kind of, I would say that, that felt kind of like, um, kind of a cheat in, um, in, in um, Rebel Heist. Here it works really well because um, Vader's um, his um, his nature is um, Wood doesn't doesn't hold back on like detailing on Vader's like um, brutal and ruthless nature at all. I mean, like from let's see from the fact that we're t- that um, he um, visits Cor- Coruscant to um, you know take out just um, take out um, ask find out why the guys in Imperial Intelligence um, you know screwed up on this and the days he spent quote unquote raising morale. Um, yeah, that's, that's, see, that's pretty intimidating, especially as conveyed by the art from fucking Dopricio. Does a good job with the, um, with the story here. And also the, um, and also just the fact that, um, Vader comes off as a very intimidating presence throughout. And also just, you know, the, uh, let's see the, uh, it's like the, um, the Lieutenant here, it's like, she's, um, it's like she's also you just really really do feel for her in the sense that you know she's she's dealing with um you know, like like one of the most fearsome presences in the it's like in the empire who's also you know working against the emperor's wishes at this point so she's walking a very very fine um like line here in order to um you know hey okay if i you know if i screw up you know hey even if i if i even if i manage to placate vader you know, I'm still going to have to worry about you know dealing with the emperor and how he feels at this moment. Like, it, does she survive at the end? You have to read it to find out. It's like I, it's like I was really impressed by by Wood's take on take on Vader. Just someone who was like throughout the course of the of his run, just someone who was in a like in a weakened position, but still thoroughly intimidating here. And his work on Five Days of the Sith really um like just does a great job of conveying that you know hey I, you know Jill and ever decides that. Once Dylan decides to stop writing um, the, the ongoing Vader series at Marvel, I'd love to see um Wood take a, take a crack at it here because he he has a great job of, of um get getting the whole intimidating and ruthlessness ruthless feeling of Vader. It's like in in these two issues. Let's see. Then you get the uh, final two issues, which is basically a two part adventure from involving Han Luke Han Luke and Leia. It's like and and three PO as well. It's like, and it's, and it basically involves, um, it's like them, involves like all of them going out to, uh, to rescue a, like a friend, a former friend of Leia's who's working as a deep, as a deep cover, um, rebel, rebel operative. And, um, she's, and apparently she's got some information that may be key to the, um, like to the, like to the success of the rebellion. Problem is, she's also got a, um, droid bounty hunter by the name of IG-88, um, also like, um, hot on her trail as well. So there's. So there's that cont- to contend with. So it's like, it's solid, you know, hey, we've got a problem, like, we've got, and everyone's got to, like, you know, work together in order, in order to solve it. And, um, and everyone's special, everyone's particular talents are this way pretty well. And he's got a, it definitely shows off he's got a good hand, handle on all the characters here, particularly um, Han and Lee is bickering, it's like over the course of the run. Now, it's like, but the thing that makes this, um, these two issues great is, or, Elevates them, in my opinion, is the fact that um, original artist um, Carlos de Anda um, returns to these final two issues. I I really enjoyed his his, exa- his exaggerated um car- like uh, not 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 quite cartoonish, slightly over the top take take on these on the uh, characters and the look of the world. And I just thought it it really fit the uh, like the look of Star Wars. And I would have loved to have seen them t- seen him do all twenty issues, but that just wasn't wasn't in the cards. But I'm glad that he came back for these final two issues to send it off because because they look fantastic and um again so and you know hey, if i assume that hey if marvel's ever looking for someone to um pick up after you know hey i, I mean well, after um cassidy cuts out for the first arc because dude's dude as great as he is 
is not a book a month kind of guy. Um, it's like, you know, someone else is going to be picking up right after those first, first four or five issues. That's all I can say. And, um, and hey, Danda, um, he's, he's great stuff. I'd love, to, I'd love to see more of his work. But overall, it's like, I mean, I'll tell you, Dark Horse has done really well by the, uh, it's like, but, by um by Star Wars over the years and Star Wars has you know done really well for them too, so I, so yeah it's like I even though it's like Marvel's got some great people assigned to these ongoing titles I I don't know it's like I just still keep feeling that you know at some point uh, they're just going to it's like it's it's going to be uh you know it's going to be one of like what happened with Halo I mean it's this big bright shiny thing they had Halo and um Stephen King's Dark Tower. Um, books and so they hey they had this great shiny toy to play with initially, but then they just couldn't um, maintain the uh, interest and and as sales started to wane, then they just started you know hey we're not gonna um, keep promoting these as as much as they were, so essentially it's going to become a secondary concern at this point to the point where hey as I like to, as I keep pointing out Halo is now being published by uh, it's like by Dark Horse so. We'll see how things go. But the reason I don't want to um, brand this as the last um, Dark Horse, it's the last Star Wars podcast I'll be doing is because, well, it, well podcast about Dark Horse's Star Wars comes because there's still a lot of stuff from Dark Horse that I haven't read, um, including um, like their Invasion um, series, which um, actually something I, something I didn't bother picking up because it hails from the uh, New Jedi Order um, time timeline, which is about twenty five years after. Um, let's see, was it twenty five years after Return of the Jedi, or twenty five years after? Yeah, twenty twenty five years after. Um, it's like af- after um, Episode Four, and basically, um, I there's like I said, there's a time when I read every um, Dark Horse, every um, novel that came out in Star Wars, and then um, the New Jedi Order came out, and it was like. Oh well, there's this big new threat called the Yuzan Vong, and um, hey, you know, even though like the yeah, Republic has faced a lot of other assaults from you know alien races, here's another one. Only they're bigger, better, and meaner than everyone else. Okay, so I lost interest after um after the first few volumes. That's basically when I started falling out, falling out of interest with out of contact with Star Wars itself. Um, but then I decided, well, you know, hey, if these Chances are these volumes are probably going to be um, going out of print as well, so I might as well pick up. I picked up the first one um, at Comic Con earlier this year. Now these are these volumes. The series is by um, let's see by writer Tom Taylor and artist um, Colin Wilson. Wilson is a great artist, and he pr- and he's um, on great form here. I know him mainly because of his work on miniseries like Ed Brubaker's Point Blank, which introduced us to um, Colden Harver from. From Brubaker's Sleeper series, and um, and Garth Garth Ennis's um, like um, Battler Britain, another of his, it's like another um, war series he did, um, focusing on, Brit- on an old British wartime character. It's like and the uh, and one of the arcs he did for the Losers. Basically, he established he's he established himself as a guy who um, he's got a like a basis in European comics, and he's and the guy does um really solid work, like um, it's like um regardless of what he. Regardless of what um, universe he's working in, and that's that's true here. It's like he does, he's great at bringing the um, at um, to bring the, the Star Wars universe to life, and it's very it's various diverse alien, it's like it's like alien inhabitants, and the as well as its tech as well. The series looks great, and but it, and it's also and uh, as for how it reads, well, you know, not not bad actually. I mean, yes, it's still about you know the, like the whole the whole Yuuzhan Vong threat, and um. Even though it's like you know, most of the time you'd expect uh, you, know, you know them like Dark Horse comics to uh, focus on you know on another group of people who aren't central to the conflict because you know they didn't have any say in you know how this is going to play out. Um, it basically takes place on the um, it's like involving the uh, the royal family of Ar- Arturus, a uh, who uh, who are basically shattered as far as the uh, like once you use Yuuzhan Vong invasion hits. It's like their father is. Father is presumed dead. Um, son Finn, Finn Galfridian turns out to be force sensitive and is recruited by Luke Skywalker to come back to his um to his um, Jedi Academy in Yavin Four. And his sister Kay is captured by the 
his sister, his sister Kay and his mother are captured by the Yuzan Vong. It's like and um and subject to their like to their torture and interrogation as well. Meanwhile, it's like um Taylor fi- also finds a t- finds a way to work in, you know, like cameos and supporting roles for for Luke, Han, Leia, and um and um Han and Leia's kids as well. This their involvement kind of feels you know, it's like I, I can understand the, you know, why you'd want to work them into this because you know they're they're, they're iconic characters who are central to the uh, it's like to the Star Wars saga, and you know he does a, and he has a good handle on their it's like on their characters as well. But you know they, they're like I said, he's not able to do anything like you know particularly drastic or or it's like or interesting with them. Like, even though the fact that you know we know that um, Anakin. Like that, Tan's broken up with the fact that Chewie died saving his son Anakin, and this will kind of blaming Anakin for his for his son's death as well. He can't actually deal with the you know, whole resolution of such a thing because you know that's something that I assume would be handled in the books because that they they were the driving force behind this, it's like behind this particular um, storyline. But as it is, um, like Invasion, like reads, um, it's a re- it's a it's a decent read, um. They can move moves pretty fast. Has a good, good, good deal of entertainment, inter- entertainment value to be, su- to be sucked from it. But you know, it's like, and it ends on a cliffhanger. Well, not really a cliffhanger. Just saying, it, just kind of like a big to be continued moment. So hey, you know, if I want to find out what's going to happen next, I'm going to pick up the, the uh, subsequent volumes. You know, before they go completely out of print. And that's that's the thing here. A lot of the stuff I'm talking about. I mean, Woods um series is. Definitely going to go out of print because Marvel, because the um, grounded covers is all pretty much the exact same stuff that um, Marvel is going to be covering in its own titles. So, so there you go. So, something to consider right here. So, you like Dark Horse, um, Dark Horse's Marvel com, Dark Horse's um, Star Wars comics? Get them now. Well, they're still going to be dirt cheap and in print from the company. Otherwise, you're probably going to be paying a real steep premium later on, like depending on whether or not they get reprinted. Depending on whether or not they're they're reprinted at all, so there you go. So, John, um, any thoughts on your end from this? Yes, there are plenty. So, I've always wondered what you could offer a droid bounty hunter. Like, what is of value to him? Well, I mean, like the these money. <laughs> yeah, it's like everyone I mean, loves money. <laughs> yeah, he was talking about like um, IG88 is going on. Like, hey, you know, I I. As soon as I turn this bounty in, I'm going to get I get myself reprinted, um, um, redone in this like you know fan, fancy uh, in this fancy metal. So. <laughs> exactly. I'm getting I'm getting chrome plating. <laughs> exactly. That's that's basically what he's what he's going on what he's going on off while he's um while he's I'm um, trying to um you know bag while he's trying to bag Leia's friend. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, no. Uh, I guess the biggest you know it's kind of you know these, uh, you know. Uh, your opinion on a lot of these stories, you know, is this is kind of a little bit of a legacy ending here. It's sort of like, hey, these are these are good stories, most of them, right? Yeah, I mean, I uh, mean, I... yeah. Go on. No, no, go on. Well, I mean, because it's it's now it's you know, um, and I know that Lucas George Lucas, he was like, yeah, whatever is out there, that's all canon. That's great, you know, for the most part. Um, but you know. Now there's a measuring stick, and uh, people are like, well, Disney can do no wrong. Marvel and Disney and all them, they can't do wrong. Well, maybe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not saying that they have, you know, that, you know, that I'm pretty sure they'll put good effort into it, but, you know, it, it can't, anything new that's created, you know, um, will inevitably be compared to this material, I think. Yeah, it's like, that's. See, that's what I think, but um, it's like it. I mean, say, I imagine that like, you know, they're, depending on how Marvel on how Marvel stuff goes, I mean, like Dark Horses stuff could either either be swiftly forgotten in the sense that hey, you know, oh, the Marvel stuff is so much better, or what I think is probably more likely to be happening because you know, as soon as Marvel loses interest with the uh, with the licenses, that they'll go and say, like, man, like Dark Horse, the Dark Horse stuff is so good. Why can't Dark Horse? Like why can't they um, Dark Horse keep get get the license back and all? Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, so I guess that begs the question: Has there ever has this situation ever existed before with Marvel? 
What, do you mean where they've, um, like, lost the license to something and then gotten it back? Or something like that, yeah, to that effect. Marvel used to do a lot of licensed stuff in the 80s. I mean, they were, yeah. they, they were the ones who gave us um, all the original run of Star Wars comics, mm-hmm. along with um, the like, original runs for G.I. Joe and Transformers comics as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but has they ever, have they ever been gotten, um, have they ever gotten these licenses back? No, I mean, the fact that um, they're getting the Star Wars license is just more of a matter of happenstance than anything else, mm-hmm. really. Yeah. <laughs> And he's just like, hey, it's like, hey, we're getting the Star Wars comics along with all the, all the movies. Bonus! <laughs> hey, we own you guys. <laughs> Here you go. It gives it all. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's all one big happy family, as they say. So, you know, it's got to go somewhere. They've got to have someone that will create it. And Marvel seems like to be the easiest and quickest route to go. Yeah, I mean, hey, it's like, you know, it, it's always better to create, create this stuff in-house. And um, you know now that the um, you know now that um, Marvel and Marvel and um, Star Wars are part of the same family, I mean it's probably not going to like things aren't probably never going to see the, uh, the license, license leave again. Because, yeah, I mean, it can always because it can it can always be done in house and always be and always be done cheaper as a result. Right, correct. I uh, oh, hold on a second here. Whew, headphone problems there. Um, yeah, I totally tend to agree with you there, sir. So, you know. And, of course, well, it'll just be a time. We'll see. But, I mean, you know, their um, their track record has been pretty decent so far. So um, Yeah, I just hope that they don't um, do the whole um, premier hardcover treatment with this. Because fuck that noise. I mean, I don't want to pay 25 bucks for, um, like, like for, for, these, for these things from, from now on. So that's that's gonna be a gig- I mean, it's always it's already a pain paying twenty bucks for five issues, but um, having to wait an extra extra six to eight months for this stuff to come out in paperback, it's like, oh god! At least it's it's already hard enough trying to trying to just find myself, you know, like why I'm buying buying a lot of Marvel stuff in hardcover. At, it's like as is, but mm-hmm. but I guess we'll see. Yes, we will. Do you have any idea what the hell you're gonna talk about next time? Uh, we're actually, we are going back to the Marvel well next time because I've got my I got the uh, their latest um, event mini series, Original Sin. It's like in hardcover, and I'll be dis- discussing whether I think the uh, whether I think who shot the Watcher is an interesting um, it's an interesting enough event in order to um, warrant um, you paying um, fifty to seventy five bucks for it. All right, and we'll catch you next time on Comic Picks by the Glick. Right, later. All right, bye. <laughs>